Hello, we are ready with our new episode. Today we will be speaking to Father Cedric Prakash. Father Cedric Prakash is a well-known human rights and peace activist. He has won several awards for his work. Uh, I'll just name a few of the awards that he's won because there's a very long list actually. He has won the National Minority Rights Award, which was given to him by the government of India. He has also won the very prestigious Legion of Honor Award given by the President of France. He has won the Mother Teresa International Award in 2013. The President of India gave him the Kabir Puruskar. Also, very recently, he has won the Lifetime Achievement Award given by the All India Catholic Union. This is in October 2023. Currently, Father Sadiq Prakash is based in Ahmedabad, but he has worked in many, many places. He has worked in Chennai, in Delhi. He was also in Beirut, where he was working for the Jesuit Refugees Service. And he worked with uh, Syrian, Jordanian, and other refugees when he was based in Beirut. So let's get down to talking to him. Welcome, Father Sadiq Prakash, to our show. Good. Thank you very much, Sonal. It's good to be on your show. It's not the first time, but for me, I'm both honored and privileged to be on your show. Father, we would like to know what you have to say about the Uniform Civil Code, which has been just, uh, you know, introduced in Uttarakhand. Uh, the Christian community and other minorities are very worried about uh, this particular uh, law. Um, I think there is a lot for each one of us to say regarding the Uniform Civil Code, because I think it is a ploy. It is a strategy by which the ruling regime, namely the BJP, is trying to polarize the people of India. Now, how do you have a Uniform Civil Code if you have not addressed the Hindu undivided family, okay? And the whole taxations and the exemptions that they allow. Can you have a uniform civil code if you're not going to touch or address the vast majority of the people? How do you have a uniform civil code if you're not going to touch the tribals and the Adivasis of India who have specificities in, in their, their marriages, in their customs, in their rituals, in their birth practices, um, you know, in almost everything? How do you have a uniformity in this if you're not going to touch key segments of the population of India. Do you mean to say that this Uniform Civil Code is only targeting the Muslims and the Christians of India? Then it's highly discriminatory. It goes against the Constitution of India. Yes, and people are now worried that after it's passed here, it will get passed in other uh, BJP-ruled states. And then maybe it'll come, you know, be passed in the whole of the nation. So. Do you think the, uh, the Christian and uh, Muslim communities are actually right in being worried about this particular act? Um, see, um, I think um, we need to look at the way targeting is done, the way profiling is done, the way discrimination is done. And I think that is a clear strategy of the ruling regime. The fact that they will, from Uttarakhand, they will put it in the BJP, uh, um, they will try to pass it in the other BJP states and bring it as a national legislation, I think is a foregone conclusion. The argument they give is about Goa, you know, where there is a sizable Christian population and we have had a uniform civil code. Uh, in many countries where there is uniformity in cultural practices, in traditions and so on, the uniform, a uniform civil code is, I think, ideal. But there is a specificity which calls for, that is why the Constituent Assembly, if you look at the debate regarding having one civil code for the country, right at the time of the Constituent Assembly, there was a lot of debate. And they decided to keep it pending because the time was not opportune. If you have, want to have a uniform civil code, are you going to have consultations, say with the two largest minorities of the country, namely the Muslims, and the Christians. What about the Sikhs, the Jains, the Buddhists, the Parsis and the others who have their own specificities? 
Why are you not calling for a dialogue with the tribals, with the Adivasis, who constitute a fairly large section of the society of India? And above all, how do you address the Hindu undivided family, the whole legislation, very especially where taxation is concerned? If you are serious about a uniform civil code, if you want to make it constitutional, you'll have to bring all the stakeholders, all the players into a dimension of consultation and to arrive at a decision which does not negatively affect any single part of the country because that it would be uh, it would mean blatant be, be blatantly anti-constitutional and against the fundamental rights of a minority now that we are talking of profiling you want to say something about what's happening in madhya pradesh where uh, uh, christian priest and uh, other uh, leaders are being profiled yes i think it is very serious it's been happening and a lot of christians there in madhya pradesh have been voicing their resentment about what is happening the way the christians are being profiled this was happening in gujarat in 1999 and Justice Kala of the Gujarat High Court, you know, who later on became the Chief Justice of the Rajasthan Court, I appeared as an, as, an, uh, as an independent and on behalf of the United Christian Forum for Human Rights um, here in Gujarat. And Justice Kala, in his, in his order dated the 16th of February 1999, and, um, uh, 99, very clearly says that this is the, uh, the whole law is blatantly unconstitutional and no one can be discriminated against on the basis of caste or religion. And he says only um, even to identify criminals, it is therefore clearly a matter which is essentially in the nature of a public interest litigation and in the opinion of this court, it will be in the fitness of things and it will be appropriate even otherwise looking into the gravity of the issues. So he has declared that what the Gujarat government was doing in 1999 has unconstitutional, has null and void, which forced the Gujarat government to, uh, you know, to uh, withdraw that survey that they were doing on the Christians and Muslims of Gujarat in 1999. Can this be taken as a precedence? And this has to be challenged not merely in the Madhya Pradesh High Court, but also in the Supreme Court. No community can be profiled on the basis of religion. That is blatantly unconstitutional and we have to raise our voice against it. Currently the Christian community, it's not so well known but has been repeatedly targeted. Just recently there's been this event in uh, Uttar Pradesh where um, the Methodist church uh, leaders were arrested, have been arrested and also a, a Catholic priest has also been arrested because his, it was his church which was being used for this uh, meeting that they were having there. Do you have uh, more on that? See, see uh, what is happening to the Christians, a minuscule minority in India, has been happening with frightening regularity. And I think this, uh, be, I'm a Christian I, and I will never play, you know, the victim card. But we will have to stand up for the rights, our rights as citizens of India. Let's say what is happening in, to the Christians today. They, it happened just last Sunday. I think it was the 4th of February, where a group of, of uh, other um, sisters and brothers were having their regular prayer service in a Catholic pastoral center. And they have a right to have their meetings, to have their prayer meetings anywhere. And the Catholics always welcome them, and they have been having it with Sunday they storm in and start accusing them of conversion, start accusing them of eating beef, and all kinds of the most ridiculous things. And then some of the pastors have been arrested, and also the Catholic priest, who's the director of this. And he has still not yet got, got his bail, which is already now about four or five days down the road. Then it has happened now in Ambikapur. There is, um, you know, a little girl who was there, uh, you know, with three other girls in a toilet in a Catholic school. One sister, just yesterday, a day before yesterday, asked them, why are you, the three of you, together in a toilet? This girl goes home and writes a suicide note and naming the sister, and now the sister has been arrested as an accessor to the suicide of the girl. 
Then there is what is happening just now in, in um, the hostels. There in several parts, um, the Christian hostels, especially the Catholic ones, are accused of making the children do even manual work. Now, I think this is ridiculous. In all our hostels, all our boardings, one of the things we teach the children, which is a very Gandhian principle, is the dignity of labor. And we ask the children to help in small little course um, in, in the community, in the hostel, either in the cutting, cutting of the vegetables, cleaning of the place, and so on. This happens everywhere. It's happening here at the Gandhi Ashram. So I don't think the, the when you target only the Christian institutions, I think you're doing something which is denigrating and demonize, the demonization of a minuscule minority in the country. And we have any amount of instances happening, very especially in the Hindi belt, to the Christians, and particularly in the state of Uttar Pradesh. This latest incident happened in the Lucknow Diocese. Yes. In Barabanki district, yeah. the one we are talking about, uh, where uh, this diocesan pastoral center, where there yeah. was this attack. And uh, I would also like uh, you to tell me, uh, what are your views on what's happening in Manipur? And you know, this violence from now May 3rd onwards, it's like more than seven, eight months, I think. Yeah. I think Manipur is a tragedy of immense proportion. Uh, the way from the 3rd of May, the cookies, the vast majority of them are Christian. Some per percentage of the Maitiyas are also Christian, have been targeted. Their churches have been demolished. Their houses have been destroyed. They have been displaced. They are still living in camps. Many of them have been killed and so on. I think it is calls for for um, an intervention of the you know of the highest proportion. And I think here, you know, secular society of India should take cognizance from the third of May. The prime minister and the home minister were busy with their road shows in Karnataka. I was there in Karnataka at that time prior to the elections, and there is not a whimper of asking either from the, uh, the Prime Minister, the Home Minister, or from the Chief Minister to stop the violence. And everybody knows who are responsible for the violence. And who are the victims? Who are the perpetrators of the crime? The ones who give their, their TV shows, uh, you know, and speak to even the likes of Karan Tappar, nothing happens to, to, to those groups. And even on the eve of Republic Day, this particular group, led by their mighty leaders, has called all the MLAs together for a meeting and they have to listen to his diktat. Yeah. I think cannot the Home Minister of the Government of India not take a stand on this. Only when some kind of somebody with a Muslim name happens to do something, immediately is branded as a terrorist. These are the terrorists of India. Why are you not putting them in jail? Why are you not preventing their hate speech? I think this is important and we need to look at it not merely as civil society but in order to preserve the ethnicity of the Kuki minority there in that hill state of Manipur and also to that extremely uh, small Christian group which is living there in fear and trepidation all the time. The Christian community actually is very worried um, with the forthcoming elections, parliament elections, which are going to be held maybe in April or May. And uh, they are worried that things will change and their, a lot of their rights will be curtailed. You have been talking to, you actually meet and talk to many uh, people and many groups. What is your sense of this? Yeah, I've been working a lot with civil society um, all over the country. I've been working with um, people in, in, in high places. I've been working with Christian groups. I've been addressing groups all over the country. And it's clear, people want to change, okay? But people also would like the opposition to be united. And people also know about the way the ruling regime operates today with, with, with money, with muscle, with the, the mafia that is with them, 
and also with the machine nations, the way they kind of tamper with the EVMs and so on. There were thousands of people protesting in Delhi today. So I think, but generally there is a lot of hope in the country. People, if you, I, I am permitted to use a very Christian illustration. It is about David and Goliath. And the Goliaths of the past have been brought down to their knees, have been overcome by very ordinary people. So I think we need to strategize. We need to work a lot with civil society. We have to ensure that our name is on the electoral roll. We have to go out on, and vote. Because even in the Karnataka elections, hundreds and thousands of minority names, mainly Muslims and Christians, had disappeared from the electoral rolls overnight. Get ourselves enrolled immediately, preferably by the end of February, because elections can be announced anytime, and they still have to finalize the electoral rolls. Get other people, you know, to have their names. Having an epic card will not do. The third that we want to do is, Go out and vote. Monitor what is happening at the election booths, at the way people come out to. Because we have seen in many places the amount of money they will give people, you know, liquor and meat overnight. They will buy them up. You know, they have tons of money. They have made it to demonetization. Why is the judgment on the electoral bonds not come out still? It's one of the most corrupt actions of this current regime. And still the Supreme Court has not come out with with an order on it. And they've got tons of money, which many people do not have. But the will of the people, I believe, will triumph. And as we sing, uh, thanks to the likes of Martin Luther King and so on, we shall overcome. And the truth shall set us free. Actually, there is a very big uh, campaign for uh, uh, EVM machines, yeah. against EVM yes, machines. What, uh, what is your uh, take on it? See. Um, I really don't think that this election commission is going to look seriously on, into it. There are plenty of, of, of petitions here in the Indian Institute Management. We have also had top technicians coming and demonstrating how the EVMs can be manipulated before one exercises their franchise, during and even after how things can be. And even EVMs disappear, EVMs are found, you know, has junk and so on, and that's a fact. But they're not going to do it. I don't think it will need a huge amount of commitment to go back to the ballot paper. But what is a, um, why is the Supreme Court delaying? Uh, in an order which they have passed, that is that every voter needs to have the paper proof of whom they have voted for, what is called the VV Pact, the, the verification of, you know, of the whole process. Why is it not having the VV Pacts in order? Why is the election commission stalling on this, which is a Supreme Court order? And that's what the people of India should ask. I know there are many countries like Belgium and so on who still have the EVMs, but people have a proof of whom they have voted for. But the fact remains that EVMs can be manipulated can be tampered with, and we all know that the BGP has been winning elections, also with the tampering of machines in a very, very selective way. But if there is good monitoring, as we saw in Karnataka, if there is um, a presence in the booth of opposition, you know, cadre workers, mm -hmm. then I don't think they can get away lightly, as we saw in the election result in Karnataka. So basically, you're pushing for VVF pads. I'm pushing for VV pads, mm -hmm. and so ideally, it should be maybe the ballot paper. Back to the ballot paper, as United States and many other countries do it still, you know. And we can have the results being announced in a phased manner. Mm -hmm. But there is also booth capturing, also ballot papers which disappear, and so on. If people want to be corrupt, they can be corrupt in any system. But we have to address corruption, which is endemic which is systemic in India today. Home Minister Amit Shah announced that they will be implementing the NRC, National Registry of Citizens, and the CAA Acts, which they have actually passed. So you have a take on that? Yes. On the 9th of December, the day before Human Rights 2019, they passed the Citizenship Amendment Act, and there is a National Register of Citizenship and so on. Um, um, I work also with the Citizens for Justice and Peace. We're doing a lot of work in Assam. 
And we realized that a lot of the illegal people who have come in, you know, have been, uh, religion, um, citizenship should not have any religious label. And this Citizenship Amendment Act is discriminatory. So why do you speak only of Hindus and Sikhs and Jains and Christians? Why are you not including Muslims, Muslims in that? Yeah. Okay. I mean, so it is um, unconstitutional. They have been in 2019 and early in 2020 till the COVID broke out. There have been hundreds and thousands of protests, like the classic example was Shainbagh mm. in Delhi. And people have been arrested. People have been, uh, here in Ahmedabad, I was also for some time under detention, protesting against it. But um, it needs to be challenged. While the Home Minister can say, say and they have, they have started detention centers, but how do you single out the, only the Muslim community? Besides, okay, even for many other communities, including the Christians, just take, for example, a Christian has come in illegally from Pakistan before 2014. Um, he is going to ask for citizenship. Do you think he's going to get citizenship um, immediately? They are going to ask, who has been protecting you? Where have you got all this illegal Aadhaar card, you know, from, which is a fraud? How you have got a job? How you have been living in India for so many years, for t maybe 10, 12, 20 years and more? Uh, because all the others who have been protecting this person, even if the person is a Christian from Pakistan or Bangladesh or Afghanistan, are accessors to a crime. And this the court has not looked into. Let's not be fools. The CA, the NPRs, uh, NPR and so on are blatantly the, unconstitutional. The NRC. the NRC, sorry, the National Register of Citizenship are basically are blatantly unconstitutional and are going against the, the fundamental of citizenship, either for those who have come from abroad and so on. And our past citizenship acts, I think, are sufficient to provide citizenship to anyone coming from anywhere. I would like to ask you one question, play the devil's advocate here. Where exactly is the Christian community really getting uh, out on the streets or protesting or standing up for the rights of others? Yeah. Dalits, tribals, Muslims. Is there any kind of move to do that? I, I agree, I agree. Here in Ahmedabad, we have hardly had any Christians in all these years. You know, when we have had the Gujarat Khanage, we had very, very, very few Christians, I must say, because we are basically self-centered. We are selfish. And this is not what Jesus taught us. In the large judge, judgment, Jesus will tell us very clearly, whatever you do to the least of my sisters and brothers, we forget the birth of Jesus was to shepherds. They were living on fringes of society. They were the marginalized. We forget that those three kings, the Magi that we are speaking about, are Gentiles who do not believe in the coming of the Messiah, but they knew um, you know, there would be somebody who would be coming. We forget that as Christians. We are very exclusive, we are very self-centered, we are very selfish, and that we have to admit. Fortunately, just now the Catholic Bishops' Conference has just come out, just oh. yesterday, the 7th, with a statement, they are saying a lot, but I still feel not enough. After that, that lunch day and uh, that get-together on Christmas Day with the Prime Minister, the event, they have seemed to make some amends, and they are speaking about what is happening to the Christians of the country, which I think is... Uh, and what is happening to the people of the country, and they are calling that we must go back to the basic structure of the Constitution. They are asking for the rights of every single citizen, which I think is a step forward, but that is not enough. Unless we come out on the streets, unless we are visible and vocal, just as Jesus takes a stand for the woman caught in adultery, he hits out at a system which is inhuman, which is patriarchal, which is unjust. He does not condone the, the sin, but he takes a stand against the powerful of his land. And Jesus always hit out at them. We need to be visible and vocal. We must come out on the streets because tomorrow may be too late. The key takeaways from this Catholic Bishops' Conference of India statement of the 7th of February 2024, they have just finished their meeting in Bangalore are the following. Economic development has benefited only a small percentage of the population. That's good. Uh, it's important that they say it, but, um, and that's a fact. But they need to spell it out with statistics and so on. 
there is a sharp increase of unemployment. This is global data. Uh, the development is often done to the detriment of ecology, disrupting the life of the tribals. Mm. Father Stan Swami was fighting for the Jal jungle and Jameen of the Adivasis. What is happening to the cookies is also to disturb. They are living in the, in the hill country of Manipur. Mm. The divisive attitude, the hate speeches and the fundamentalist movements are eroding the secular ethos of the nation. That is great that they have said it. And I think this should be broadcasted to everyone here and there. Attacks on Christians, destructions of homes, churches, the harassment of personnel, serving orphanages, hostels, educational and health institutions, false allegations of conversions have become common. They have not spoken about the anti-conversion laws, which are blatantly unconstitutional. They should have spoken about that. Democratic institutions are weakening. The federal structures under stress. Media is not fulfilling their responsibility. We all know that media in India is highly codified. There is an unprecedented religious polarization, harmoning social, um, social harmony. They have not spoken about that BJP RSS construct. Uh, uh, imagine building a Ram temple on the ruins of a mosque. Okay? This has nothing to do with Lord Ram. Okay? But, but it was, as the Congress party said it, it was a BJP RSS construct. The CPC is appealing to political parties to preserve the basic structure of the constitution. We must. And this, the opposition parties must preserve and must fight for. And it re re reiterates the demand for the SC status of the Dalit Christians, which should be. But of course, the BJP regime is very frightened that once you give that status, that Dalits who embrace Christianity also have the status which, say, the Buddhists have, okay, there are hundreds and thousands and perhaps millions of Dalits who will embrace Christianity tomorrow. That is their fear. They are also talking right now of, uh, uh, you know, stripping the Adivasis of... Uh, yes, that is delisting. The, delisting. delisting them from the yeah. scheduled tribe right. status if they have... Uh, embraced if Christianity. Christian, yes, if they have embraced Christianity. Yeah, that's very true. And they have... Um, kind of brought some tribals to protest against them. It's happening in the Northeast. It's happening even in places like Jharkhand and so on. And, um, and they're dividing. Part of the, of the fascist uh, strategy anywhere in the world is divide and rule. And we have seen how they have been dividing even the Christian community. And they have been dividing the tribal Adivasi community, that those tribals and Adivasis who have embraced Christianity will be denied their uh, status as tribals and Adivasis. And I think this is again a very unconstitutional act. Right. So in conclusion, what uh, would you like to say? Uh, as a conclusion, I am a Christian. I'm a Catholic priest. I'm a Jesuit. And I'm a person of immense, unlimited hope. Because if I believe in Jesus, because I have faith in Jesus, I believe Jesus will stand by us through thick and thin. I don't think it's necessary to have, uh, to have persecution. But I think we need to stand up as our rights as Christians, and not merely our rights as Christians, to stand up for the rights of every single citizen of this country. Um, a Dalit, an Adivasi, a Muslim, you know, the, the poor Sikh farmers, the, 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 against the four labor codes. There is so much of legislation that is, that is coming into this country, which is blatantly unconstitutional, unjust, and it hits out against the poorest of the poor. My duty as a Christian is to stand up for these people. And I believe if I stand up, the struggle will be relentless, the struggle will be, will be for some time, but I believe truth, I believe justice will triumph one day. And as Tagore would say, into that heaven of freedom, my father, my mother, let my country and all those sisters and brothers listening to me awake. Okay, thanks for speaking to us. I mean, we have spoken on many, many points. You have um, shed light and your views on almost all aspects which are affecting the minority community especially. Uh, so we really like to thank you for uh, your time. Uh, thank you very much, um, Sonal Kellogg. 
it's good to be on your show. I sincerely hope that once people watch this, uh, this interview, this video, there will be some small impact and that people will come out and stand up for their rights, which are basically theirs as citizens of India. We have the freedom of speech and expression, freedom of religion, freedom of life of, and liberty and livelihood. Let's stand up and speak out now for the Constitution of India and for our beloved motherland, whom we all love very much. Thank you. So we have seen what are Father Cedric Prakash's views. Please do comment and like our video, subscribe and also share them widely. Thank you.